Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Sophia Arend, and I'm the Global Blockchain Business Council's Communications and Content Lead. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to the GBBC Virtual Members Forum. This is a bi-weekly webinar we host showcasing the innovative work of our members around the world. And today we have the pleasure to be joined by Lauren Thorbjörsson, Head of Communications at the Stellar Development Foundation, and Justin Rice, Head of Ecosystem at the Stellar Development Foundation, for a presentation on how Stellar is connecting global financial infrastructure to create equitable access to the global financial system for individuals everywhere. Just before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce Lauren and Justin. Lauren is responsible for SDF's communications and public relations activities, building on Stellar's reputation as the blockchain that people know and trust. She started her career in political campaigns, which led her to the White House communications team under President Obama. She went on to work at the inter at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, on a range of policy issues like migration, education, and economic development. And before joining Stellar, she led partner communications at Salesforce, helping tell the story of the ecosystem of business that builds and implements on the platform. She holds a master's degree in international relations from the London School of Economics and a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. In his role as head of community, Justin speaks on behalf of developers building on the Stellar network and coordinates the members of the Stellar ecosystem with the ultimate focus on growth and development of that system. Justin became familiar with the Stellar technology and its benefits during his time working in product development. In that role, he helped build an exchange called Stellar X, which utilizes the Stellar open source technology. He holds a bachelor's degree in comparative literature from Harvard University. We're so pleased to have them both here with us today to give us some more information on Stellar and what they're working on. We welcome your questions at any point during today's webinar and you can submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we'll take them after the presentation. Thanks so much, Lauren and Justin, for joining us. We'll hand things over to you. Thanks, Sophia. Uh, we are really honored to have been invited here today to speak with all of you about the Stellar Blockchain Network and how it connects global financial infrastructure. Uh, as Sophia mentioned, I'm Lauren Thorbjörnsen. I'm the head of communications at the Stellar Development Foundation, where our mission is to leverage blockchain technology to drive equitable access to the global financial system. Uh, you know, given the degree of familiarity with Stellar may vary for each of you and the audience, we're going to use our time today for a brief introduction of who we are at the Stellar Development Foundation, and then an overview of Stellar, how it works, and what it was designed to do, in particular for the realm of payments. And we'll leave time at the end for your questions. To help me share all this information, I'm joined by Justin. Justin, if you want to say hi. Hi, I'm Justin Rice, head of the ecosystem here at the Stellar Development Foundation. And like Lauren, I'm very uh, honored to be invited to be here. Awesome. So let's dive in uh, with the basics. Who we are and what role do we play in this industry? So uh, the Stellar Development Foundation, or SDF for short, as we like to call it, is a nonprofit organization founded in 2014 to support the development and growth of the open source Stellar network. With Stellar, SDF seeks to unlock the, unlock the world's economic potential by making money more fluid, markets more open, and people more empowered. The, foundations help, the foundation helps maintain Stellar's code base, supports the technical and business communities around Stellar, and is a speaking partner to regulators and institutions. Everything we do is really aimed at making the network as a whole succeed. We exist in part because today's financial system really isn't working for everyone. While advancements in technology have made it so that information can be shared instantly with anyone in the world, regardless where it came from, unfortunately, the same, th same thing is just not true for money. Uh, today's pay payments landscape is slow, it's costly, and it's based on models unchanged for decades. Of hundreds of different monetary systems, each has its own unique set of services, whether that's ACH or SEPA, and then connections to the parallel systems outside its borders. Assets exist in siloed databases across disparate payment schemes and to interoperate between systems, it takes a lot of time and money. And all of these disparate banks and money transfer operators and treasuries all combine to make up the entire global financial system as we know it. And at its best, that system is slow and cumbersome and fraught with fees. And at its worst, it leaves millions of people who don't have access to traditional financial infrastructure. So, but blockchain technology is really challenging us to think about money and value in a new way and presenting the opportunity to make it better, more effective and more efficient. In much the same way the internet democratized access to information, blockchain can democratize access to the financial system. 
it can make sending value around the world as easy as sending as an, an email. Stellar, which is the subject of today's talk, is a blockchain network designed to become the next global payment standard. It's intended to enhance rather than supplant the existing financial system. So to understand how Stellar can set the global payment standard and make sending money as easy as sending an email, I wanna start by explaining what Stellar is. Because while the average consumer might not ever need to know what the, how this technology works, all of you might be able to leverage blockchain to serve consumers or citizens. So what is Stellar? At a very high level, Stellar is a decentralized open network that connects global financial infrastructure. It is a public blockchain that is built for interoperability. You'll hear that word a lot today, I think, and to further financial access and inclusion. And it can do that thanks to the speed and scale of the Stellar blockchain to transfer value and process payments in seconds rather than days and for only fractions of a cent. It helps make markets more open because when financial infrastructure is connected, you have greater geographical and affordable access to markets. And really ultimately that empowers people. Stellar was built for payments, making it easy to issue assets with minimal code in a sustainable and scalable way. And you might be asking, how does Stellar manage to do all these things? So I'm gonna turn it over to Justin to talk about that in more detail. Great, thank you, Lauren. So to understand how Stellar connects uh, financial systems so they can work together on a single platform, we're gonna delve into three questions. How is value represented on Stellar? What's the technology behind Stellar? And how does value move on Stellar? So let's start with that first one. How is value represented on Stellar? So Stellar allows anyone to create a redeemable, tradable representation of any asset, any asset. Um, often we call these digital assets tokens and in Stellar, they're actually primitives, right? They're built right into the protocol itself. So as Lauren mentioned, you can issue one in two simple lines of code. Actually, you can even now, you can use a web interface to issue one. So just click, 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 you've got an asset. You can issue an, a, a token or an asset. I'm, I'm gonna use those words interchangeably. So you can use a token, uh, issue a token that represents pretty much anything from corn bushels to gold to an hour of your time as a consultant. But tokens are most useful when tied to fiat currencies such as dollars or euros. Um, these fiat backed tokens issued by regulated financial institutions, money service businesses, or fintech companies, we call them anchors. That's the stellar vernacular, anchors. So anchors serve as the on-off ramp for the network. They connect Stellar to local banking systems and they handle regulatory compliance by doing things like collecting uh, KYC, know your customer information, so users can make deposits and withdrawals in a compliant way. Um, you can sort of see how it works here. A user deposits a traditional dollar with an anchor using traditional rails. The anchor issues them an equivalent amount of Stellar network tokens. The user can then hold those tokens in a Stellar wallet or app, and they can use them to make payments or to trade them for other assets on the network. Um, anchors maintain fiat reserves equivalent to the value of the issued tokens, so users can also redeem them back for fiat currency at any time. So when people hold the tokens, they can treat them just like traditional money, right? Because they know they're exchangeable for traditional money in the end. Now, that might seem kind of unexceptional, right? Issuing electronic credits in the form of uh, a bank account for local currencies is basically what banks do thousands of times a day. But in a global system, this one-to-one -one promise of a token for currency has important implications. For instance, no matter how a USD token moves through the economy or around the network, the underlying dollars never leave the anchor bank account in the United States. So say someone loans their tokens to someone else who then uses them to buy a car, no bank has to settle the purchase or approve the loan. And furthermore, it doesn't even matter if the seller of the car lives in Mexico or Singapore, they can still own the tokens and they can trade them however they please. And that's what we mean when we say the Stellar Network makes money orderless the network. I keep talking about the network, you know, assets like the US dollar are represented as tokens on the Stellar network. Anchors provide the on-off ramp for the Stellar network. And Lauren explained that at a high level, Stellar is a public blockchain built for interoperability that furthers financial access and inclusion. But what does that mean exactly, right? What's the underlying technology that allows all these assets to coexist and interoperate? So let's take a look, the technology behind the network. Stellar is a peer-to-peer -peer network, there's that word again, made up of nodes. Um, you know, the internet is also a network. Right? So nodes are just computers. They run a pretty ingenious piece of software called Stellar Core that allows them to connect, communicate, and keep a common accounting ledger. They accept transactions, they pool them together, they vote to approve them, and they apply them to change the ledger. The network is open participation, which means anyone 
anyone can set up a node and decentralized because these nodes are run by independent organizations all over the globe. The common ledger that they keep, uh, that, uh, <clears throat> that's, it's uh, stable, secure, and transparent. I say stable um, because it's copied on servers all over the world, so it doesn't rely on a central server and can't be turned off. It's secure because no one can change the numbers or manipulate the data to their liking. And it's transparent because everyone can see the ledger and trust that the information is correct. Um, but the ledger itself is essentially a public timestamp series of immutable data that stores accounts and keeps tracks of their balances and their offers. So it tracks what you own, as well as what you want to do with what you own. Every entry on that ledger uh, is tied to a particular account. So accounts, accounts are the central data structure in Stellar. They hold balances, they sign transactions, and they issue assets. Account access is controlled by public private key cryptography. So every Stellar account has a public key, which generally starts with a G, and a secret key, which generally starts with an S. Your public key, that's safe to share. Other people need it to actually identify your account and to send you a payment. They also need it to verify that you authorized the transaction. It's kind of like an email address, right? People need your email address to send you emails. They can also use your email address to verify that an email actually came from you. Now your secret key, on the other hand, that's private information that gives you access to your account. It's basically the password to your email account. Um, use that secret key to sign transactions, which you submit to the network to change the state of the ledger. For example, when you wanna make a payment, you submit a transaction that moves part of the balance from your account to someone else's account. Every three to five seconds, the nodes on the network combine all the transactions submitted to them into a transaction set communicate with one another using a process called the Stellar Consensus Protocol to vote on the validity of that set. And once they ratify a transaction set, it's applied to and changes the state of the ledger. That was a lot, so let's just walk through that process real quick with some nifty slides, right? It starts with the ledger. Stellar users, wherever they are in the world, submit transactions to send and exchange all kinds of assets on the network. They can move funds anywhere in the world and they can convert currencies along the way thanks to built-in order books, which we'll go over in a minute. <clears throat> These transactions are bundled into sets, confirmed by validating nodes and applied to the ledger, at which point they're final and create an immutable record. And then the whole process starts over. Every three to five seconds, transaction sets, ledger change. Transaction sets, ledger change. Um, so just one quick aside, I mentioned that generally anchors collect KYC and handle compliance when they move money onto or off the network. But I also want to acknowledge that in certain cases, businesses actually need more control over where and how their digital assets are used. And to point out that Stellar has um, built in on network mechanisms to address that need. So for instance, issuers can with a simple flag, make their asset authorization required. And that works just like it sounds. When an asset is authorization required, the issuer has to grant an account explicit approval before that account can hold or otherwise transact with the asset. Before granting that approval, the issuer can do whatever due diligence they need to do. And so they have a ton of control, a ton. And that functionality is also built in at the protocol level. So again, easy to access, easy to use, no complicated smart contracts required. Um, <clears throat> but whether anchors handle KYC at the network on off ramp or apply stricter control using built in flags, system works the same way. Accounts, balances, transactions, validation, change of ledger state, begin again. Accounts, balances, transactions, validation, change of ledger state. <clears throat> um, so the final question in our how does Stellar work section is how does value move on Stellar? So as I've mentioned, there are all kinds of digital assets on the network and together they work to create a connected global financial infrastructure. And part of the reason why that's true is because Stellar lets you do more than just send assets across the network. It also makes it easy to convert value from one currency to another. So how does value move on Stellar? There are basically three different ways. The simplest and most common way to move value on Stellar is to make a payment, right? I send USD, you receive USD. But instead of sending value to another user, I can also trade an asset I hold for another asset on the network. I sell USD for euros. Finally, I can also combine those two into a path payment, which allows me to send one currency and have the recipient receive another. So I send USD, you receive euros. Um, Trades and path payments are possible because Stellar has a built-in decentralized exchange. So in addition uh, to tracking balances as Bitcoin and Ethereum do, Stellar also tracks and settles trades uh, in a decentralized ownerless way. I think, we're, I think we might be one slide behind. 
Oh no, sorry. <clears throat> Ownerless way. Uh, users can submit their bids and ask via a simple operation. It's just like making a payment. I submit a bid. I want to sell uh, USD for euros. Um, all of these bids and asks, they're aggregated into common order books. And every ledger, the protocol automatically matches crossing offers to execute trades without the use of intermediaries. So a decentralized exchange. Um, this decentralized exchange facilitates universal currency conversion, which is not only great for traders, right? It's also great for cross-border, cross-currency transactions, which, as I mentioned before, are called path payments in the Stellar vernacular. So a path payment. A path payment allows a user to send one currency and have the recipient receive another. And it does that by combining a payment and a trade into a single atomic operation. The protocol automatically finds the best conversion rate via those order books I just described, and it routes the payment through them, and it's all done in one fell swoop. So just for example, an American company could pay an invoice in Mexico by spending dollar tokens while the vendor receives peso tokens. Both sides only get the currency they want. They never have to hold the other currency. Um, neither side incurs any kind of exchange risks or delays. And so path payments are really the fulfillment of Stellar's interoperability promise, right? Value flows seamlessly from account to account in whatever form it's most useful. That functionality, it leads right to the final question, which is, who is Stellar for? So Stellar is an open participation permissionless network. So really anyone can build anything they can imagine on Stellar. It's for everyone. But generally, it's used by companies offering financial products and services who take advantage of its features to build better solutions to real world problems. So to see what that means, let's look at some real world examples of businesses building on Stellar today. With that, I will hand it back to you. Thanks, Justin, for that technical deep dive. So uh, as Justin mentioned, I'm going to take you through uh, a couple different examples of businesses building on Stellar today, starting with one of the biggest areas of focus for many companies building on the network, which is cross-border payments. Uh, you know, billions of dollars are transferred cross-border through personal remittances every year. In most cases, remittances are transfers of money from foreign workers to family members in their home country sent on a monthly basis. In 2019, the total value of global mi migrant remittances to their home country was $554 billion. Uh, you know, how, it's hard to wrap your head around half a trillion dollars. Uh, and those are directly supporting 800 million people in less developed economies. That number has dropped in the last year due to the pandemic, but the fact remains that huge amounts of value are being transferred across border and they're vital to families, but the existing remittance infrastructure really isn't designed for many of these people who depend on them. The typical transaction is $200 to $300, and the average retail cost of these transfers runs 7 to 8%, and that's usually collected in cash. And sending costs can be as high as 15% when you're transferring money to people in developing economies. And that's no surprise if you look at the traditional way of sending cross-border payments because it's complicated. You've got financial institutions as intermediaries, agents and correspondence banks, all operating on different infrastructure in different countries and patchwork, patchworking a solution to get money from point A to point B. Settlement times are slow and it can create additional operating costs, which results in service provider fees or costs built into the FX transaction. Ultimately, that ends up costing the, the customer. And, that, and, and the ultimate end result is that the re remittance recipients receive less money. But Stellar really changes that landscape by putting all of this on a single network with a common infrastructure. Remittance service providers, digital money apps, growing fintech companies, and remote traditional banks can use Stellar to reduce the friction and costs associated with traditional MTOs, correspondent banks, and financial payment rails. And as we've mentioned, while anchors take care of the deposits, redemptions, and compliance, businesses who are building on Stellar can really focus on their customers' experience. These remittance corridors are being built on Stellar today. And a quick example uh, is two fintech companies, Tempo and Kauri, who use Stellar to facilitate remittance payments from Europe to Nigeria. So Tempo is a money transfer operator based in Paris, and Kauri is a UK and Nigerian fintech company that builds and operates electronic payment systems. So both of these companies are Stellar anchors, that term you heard Justin mention earlier, which as a reminder is that they can either issue one-to-one -one backed fiat tokens, also known as stable coins, and or provide a fiat on and off ramp. So Kauri leverages USDC, one of the world's leading digital dollar stable coins, 
as a bridge currency to help businesses reduce the friction of sending payments to and from Europe. And they work with Tempo, uh, who is also an issuer of EuroT, which is a Euro stable coin, which is also pegged one-to-one -to, -one to fiat reserves. And they've established this payment flow for their customers to send payments between the regions. So for companies like Kauri and Tempo, the cost savings of building on Stellar apply not just to capital, but to time as well. So payments on Stellar average under 10 seconds per transaction compared to five days with uh, five business days with an MTO and settle for a transact for a fraction of the typical cost. Tempo and Kauri use Stellar to facilitate cross-border payments on behalf of their users in a way that the underlying technology is opaque to the user. So many may not even know that it's powered by the Stellar blockchain. They just benefit from the efficiency. But other fintech companies build apps, often called wallets, that allow users to interact directly with Stellar. Unlike physical wallets where the asset or cash is stored inside the wallet, Stellar wallets don't store assets. Instead, they give users a way to access a Stellar account, to view the assets and data associated with that account, and to sign and submit transactions, those important keys that Justin was talking about. Wallets also connect to the anchors so that users can easily deposit and withdraw fiat currency to get on and off the network. A good example of a Stellar wallet is Lobster. Lobster is a mobile and web wallet uh, built on Stellar. It gives users access to any and all assets on the Stellar network, and it allows them to make in-app deposits and withdrawals with anchors. It's clean design and helpful features like email notifications, simplify the whole experience and make Lobster pretty user-friendly. It's important to note that not all wallets are quite as open-ended as Lobster. Some focus on a specific use case and provide users with more tailored access to Stellar. So we're building up these kinds of services, anchors and wallets all over the world. We've grown to more than 20 anchor services with many more in progress. Stellar powers each of these entities as they are solving the prevalent needs in their regional markets. Each of these entities from all parts of the world comprise our ecosystem and are part of the solution that we are collectively building as we seek to achieve a world in which where, where you live and what you have no longer prohibit you from participating in the financial system. It's pretty simple. Equitable access is not a privilege, it's a right. So I also wanna point out that this map really isn't about potential. It actually shows the achievements blockchain has already made in connecting global financial infrastructure. And that's what Stellar was created for, and that's what us at the SDF is set up to support. So why are these businesses building on Stellar? We've gone through a few of them, but I just want to recap. Stellar, ha Stellar has some serious advantages that make it simple and cost-effective platform for building financial products. First, the speed. We've talked about transactions being confirmed in, in, uh, on an average of five seconds. The cost. The cost is per transaction is negligible right, negligible. right now it's 0.0001 XLM. Asset issuance, uh, we've talked about this a lot, but just to bring it back to this, asset issuance is one of Stellar's really most powerful features, the functionality built in at the protocol level. So the supporting code is re reliable, vetted, and fast. Um, you know, This alone is one of the reasons that Stellar has become a home for so many stable coins and is actually a really great fit for certain use cases like central bank digital currencies. And then for compliance, you know, Stellar is really a leader on compliance with built-in features that allow unified KYC and AML as, George, as Justin was showing in that, um, in the ledger flow. And the Stellar network really leads the way amongst public blockchain networks by the standards it sets on compliance and creating a compliant friendly environment for the developers and businesses who are building on the network. And then Justin's team can take credit for a lot of this next one, which is developer tools, which is, you know, Stellar's open source developer resources um, provide comprehensive documentation, SDKs and tutorials. And that's something that both Justin and the entire Stellar ecosystem really contribute to, making it easy to build on Stellar. And it's sustainable because of Stellar's consensus mechanism, the network costs as much as running a server because we don't mind resource requirements are low. All of these features bring us back to how we can set a new global payment standard. So I'm gonna hand it back to Justin to wrap us up and share really the key focus of the Stellar Network, network that will help us realize this standard. Great, thanks Lauren. Um, so I wanna wrap up um, by coming back to what these use cases we've talked about, why they're so important, um, and to talk about how Stellar connects today's financial rails with new digital ones, right? So that systems of value can be interoperable across borders. and 
To do that, we'll talk about interoperability, right? It's a term that we've kicked around a lot this morning, interoperability. And we've definitely gone over what it means in one context. Stellar interoperates with the existing financial system. It connects legacy financial rails with new digital ones, so value can move across currencies and across borders with a lot less friction. And when you think about the existing system um, and how it could be slow and expensive and inequitable and all those things Lauren was pointing out, the value of innovating is quite clear. Um, and this understanding of interoperability is exactly what uh, central bank digital currencies are all about, right? They connect the old world with the new. And this is what I'll say is called intra-network op op interoperability, intra-network interoperability. Um, so digital currencies flow back and forth seamlessly on a single network. But there's also another type of interoperability, which I'll just call inter-network interoperability, where digital currencies flow back and forth seamlessly between networks. So the first intra-network interoperability, again, it connects systems on a single network with a common infrastructure so that remittance servants, providers, digital money apps, fintech companies, remote traditional banks, they can all reduce the friction and costs associated with traditional MTOs, correspondent banks, and legacy financial payment rails. But let's get real, right? There are a lot of chains out there. Wouldn't it be great if they could all work together so that all assets could exist on multiple networks at once? Yes, yes it would, right? And that's what I mean by inter-network interoperability. The good news is that it's possible today. So inter-network inter, inter -network interoperability. A great example, USDC, which is a digital asset issued by Circle. Um, it's one of the leading USD stable coins out there. It's got over $5 billion worth of USDC in circulation. So Circle created a consortium called Center in partnership with Coinbase to implement a multi-chain USDC framework to facilitate this inter-network interoperability and to provide a wide range of developers and projects and ecosystems with access to a single asset to USDC. Now, USDC is, is a really trusted asset and for good reason, right? For one thing, they publish monthly third-party attestations of their reserve. So you know that their ass assets are actually backed. You know, they're very, very transparent. So right now, USDC is live or at least almost live on four different chains. And Circle actually created APIs that are designed to meet the needs of wallets, exchanges, custodians, and other digital dollar stablecoin apps. Um, and these APIs basically make it easy to convert USDC across supported chains at no cost. So you can swap Stellar USDC for Ethereum USDC, presto change move from one network to another network, no friction, no hassle. That's what I mean by internetwork interoperability. And so now I've, I've sort of described these two flavors, intra and internetwork interoperability, big deal, right? Why does it matter? So interoperability matters because if we want blockchain to achieve its potential of really connecting global financial systems, we just can't have walled gardens like we've seen develop with the web, right? We don't want to recreate a system that is just patchwork together. So as decisions are being made about blockchain across both public and private sectors, achieving interoperability should be a goal that's driving decisions from day one. We should be thinking about how systems should, can, and will work together in order to create a really powerful and useful digital currency landscape. Um, and I think that that thinking applies to both the policy and the technology decisions. Now, part of the reason I say that is because it is very likely that blockchain is not gonna be an outcome where one winner takes all. So for example, central bank digital currencies, they are really well suited to a network like Stellar since it's designed for asset issuance so that currencies can seamlessly interoperate with each other on the same platform intra-network interoperability. And honestly, it would be great if all CBDCs were on the same network because they'd have the same standards and the same functionality. Global currencies would all be of the same design and that would be quite simple. But the reality will likely be that certain chains emerge dominant in certain regions, right? So there's a chain dominant in Latin America and another one dominant in the Eurozone. And so the real question is how can those chains interoperate? Another reality is that different chains are actually better suited for different use cases, right? So Stellar is great for payments, but other financial use cases may want Ethereum smart contracts, and they may actually be willing to pay higher fees and give up transaction speed and network throughput in order to get them. But, you know, their use case might demand things that Ethereum can provide. So how can we bridge as we build, right? What do we need to think about now? And I kind of like to bring it all back uh, right before we go into our Q&A. Um, to the idea of open networks, right? Being prepared to bridge as we build is part of what makes open networks so valuable. 
unlike closed networks, which are limited to the insights of select developers with privileged access, open networks benefit from the ideas and innovations of any and all. Open networks encourage innovation. Open networks allow for this interoperability. Now, once you've built a closed network, there are firmer boundaries and limitations in the existing banking infrastructure that shows us that they don't result in innovation, right? It's been years since that infrastructure has been updated. So my final plea, as we sort of think forward, is to think about interoperability and to realize that we need open networks to really achieve that promise. Um, and that's sort of the end here. So if you're interested in learning more about what we've shared, um, I encourage you to visit our website, stellar.org. You can poke around, learn all about sort of the high level and the more detailed uh, aspects of Stellar. And you can also um, join our community. There's a lot of discussions that are happening in the ecosystem and you can find all the different channels listed on our website. So if you really wanna get in there and engage with the people who are building on Stellar, they're very open and accessible and I encourage you to join them in really interesting conversations. Um, and I believe that's it, right? Uh, anyone have any questions? Thank you so much, Lauren and Justin. Yes, we've had a number of questions come in and I will just sort of start from the top. So somebody asked if you were running a critical national infrastructure for a stable coin, is there a risk that its bandwidth would be overloaded by other uses of the Stellar network? Um, Perhaps you could speak to scalability as well as the network continues to grow and more applications are built on it. Yeah. I you know, it, it, I, I will say that the Stellar network has a, has a throughput that is much higher than other blockchain networks. And we are very, very far from hitting uh, general network capacity. You know, there's sort of an ability to scale up from where we are. And there's research on how high we can sort of set the limits and they're a lot higher than they are and high enough to accommodate a lot of use cases. Um, I think that ultimately though with any blockchain, uh, because you are distributing transactions and requiring the consensus uh, of uh, like a bunch of computers spread across the world to achieve consensus, there's always gonna be some limit, like real limit to throughput because if you start to push too many transactions, you're asking those computers to talk about too much and you just, what you end up with is increased latency. Um, so the simple answer to the question is Stellar can handle a, a really, high capacity, especially compared to other blockchain networks. Ultimately, I think that any and all blockchains right now are also looking into basically layer two solutions that would allow the creation of payment channels so that when they're really high uh, capacity use cases, they create sort of like a, a side chain that handles a bunch of transactions and just settles periodically on the network. And um, SDF right now is, is definitely looking into those possibilities too. Thank you. Well, Peter, I hope that I hope that helped answer your question. Um, somebody else asked, what are some examples of Stellar's anchors? I know you touched on this, but maybe you could give us some examples and also um, who is a typical node? Um, so obviously USDC is an anchor, Kauri is an anchor and, and uh, Tempo is an anchor. Those are the ones that we brought up in the presentation. In addition, there is, uh, there is an anchor in, in Brazil, in Argentina, there are anchors in, um, Lauren, do, do you remember, what, like, can you, can you list some of the other places? Yeah, we also have some in Africa beyond Nigeria. So we have um, in uh, Tanzania and Senegal. And I think we have a few more launching in Africa soon. I can't, can't diver, divulge yet. Don't want to scoop our news. Um, and I believe also in, in Mexico. And, and generally those anchors are people that are building on the network and anchoring an asset is part of a, a business plan, right? So they're setting up a remittance corridor or they have you know, a wallet or application that is consumer facing. And by creating the on off ramp, they make it easier for their consumers to, to take advantage of the Stellar network. And then they also sort of serve at, because they can connect to other anchors, they allow this like kind of interoperation across currency. So, it, it, it is a lot of a lot of the current anchors are you know they're regulated financial institutions. A lot of them are fintech companies who are trying to transform payment space uh, and sort of make cross border payments more efficient. Apologies, I was on mute. Um, okay, um, somebody also asked. I know well. There's been recent announcements that Stellar is working with Ukraine to develop a CBDC. Perhaps you could um, touch on the nature of that of Stellar's involvement and and what's happening there. Sure, I can chime in on this one. 
Uh, so the, actually, it, we're, we're serving as an advisor to the Ukrainian Ministry of Digital Transformation, uh, kind of in their exploratory um, phase of understanding, like how do they build a digital asset strategy for the for the for the country, and uh, understanding how a CBDC would be implemented is part of that. Uh, ultimately, the issuance of a CBDC would be working very closely with the Central Bank of Ukraine. So there are a lot of stakeholders in this process, but we are there in advisory capacity to kind of help them figure out what is their overall strategy and, and not just thinking about CBDCs and, and you know all the implications that Justin talked about there in terms of interoperability, but also from a bigger perspective of digital assets in general and stable coins, you know, we see a lot of these questions come up not just in Ukraine, but in many countries, right? Like how do you kind of build a framework, a regulatory framework around these? So those are the types of questions we're gonna help them address as part of this working group. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so you discussed remittances, CBDCs, and somebody asked, how does Stellar approach custody, particularly in geographies where access to technology might be limited? And you mentioned your wallet, maybe you could um, discuss a little bit the wallet, but also perhaps um, kind of education that happens on the ground to, to, to get users up to speed. I, I mean, I think that the, the sort of model for using Stellar is again, that anyone can issue an asset and that these regulated financial institutions, they custody assets in their local jurisdiction and comply with local laws. So essentially, you know, wherever you live, you, you can transact with a banker with, with, a, with a, uh, an anchor um, via traditional banking rails and that anchor will custody your assets. Um, you know, I, did, I'm not sure if that answers the question though. For whomever asked, please feel free to drop in a second question. I hope that I hope that answered it. And um, also, if it's from uh, from a legal perspective, feel free to also email us. Uh, you can email me directly at lauren at stellar.org. I am not the legal mind, but I could definitely ask our compliance folks who might be able to uh, answer a custody uh, custodial question more directly. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess the, the, the other thing I just want to make clear is that the Stellar Development Foundation where we work is, you know, we, we sort of help support this network. And our goal is it, the organizations that use it are, are independent entities. And so, um, you know, they're, they're all very compliance focused and we do have, uh, you know, we, we, we make sure that they have the tools to be compliant, but in a given region, each organization uh, abides by their, own, by their own local laws and regulations and sort of focuses on how to build that, uh, product on Stellar in a compliant fashion. Thank you. We also had a question on just um, wire transfer regulatory compliance. Um, and I hope that this, that your point on jurisdiction also covers that. Um, and for Peter, you can also reach out to, um, to Lauren who can connect you uh, with the folks who deal with that. Um, what are, somebody else asked, what are the best, sorry, forgive me, what are the biggest obstacles to stellar adoption? Um, they said, you know, is it competition from centralized entities such as banks or central banks? Is it regulation or is it competing blockchain networks or none of the above? I have some thoughts, but Justin, I'll let you jump in first. Yeah, I, I think that the, the obstacles to stellar adoption are sort of generally the obstacles to adoption of blockchain, right? It's, it's a new technology, people don't yet understand it. And I think that, that, that they don't yet understand how to use it or what its potential is. And so I think a lot of the biggest obstacles can be solved via education. We can educate businesses, we can educate consumers, we can educate policymakers in order to help them understand not only that blockchain is useful, that it can do all these things that we just talked about doing, but that it can do them in a compliant way and that it can do so in a safe way, in a way that protects consumers. And so it's just this like idea of, of what the technology is for and how it is uh, actually, you know, it, it, it's, it's actually a safe and, and, and useful um, way to approach or, or solution to some of the problems that exist. I think it's just education. I agree. And the one thing I would just add on to that is that, you know, I think what sometimes is hard for people like us who are in the industry who are very enthusiastic and we all see the potential is that change is slow, right? If you think, I could go back to some of my experience working in cloud software, you know, there are still people who build on-premise, you know, who are resistant to putting things in the cloud. It's, and you know, that's a technology that's been around for a long time. So when you're talking about the financial system, which has been built up over decades and really hasn't changed that much, um, you know, there's a lot to work through there and a lot of people who have vested interests of, and you know, what can we do to educate them to show how this could really transform the system and make it better. 
Thank you. Paul also asked, uh, who is typically using Stellar? Um, is it is its uptick as prevalent across traditional players as disruptors? Um, perhaps you could just, uh, on a macro view, who are who are the typical Stellar users? I think most of the companies that are building on Stellar are fintech companies. They're a little more nimble than a lot of the traditional players. And they're out there trying to find new ways to innovate in order to reduce some of the friction involved in things like cross-border payments. So I think the majority of them are these sort of forward-looking um, new institutions that, uh, and, and organizations and businesses that see the advantage and can move quick to take it to, to sort of grab it. Now that said, you know, one of the uh, most recent sort of launches of an asset on Stellar was a Euro asset from a, a European bank called Bankhaus von der Heidt, which has been around since, you know, the 1700s. And so we are also seeing more and more sort of traditional financial institutions look to Stellar as they start to realize the importance of blockchain and as they start to see the benefits of using a platform like Stellar to solve for some of the problems that they even experience. So I'd say right now, still early adopters, mostly fintech companies, but we're starting to see the sort of slower moving, bigger organizations also see the potential. Thank you. Um, two more questions here. So Flare Network recently announced that it will integrate Stellar Lumens. I don't know if this is an announcement that you'd like to touch on. Um, or if the Seller Development Foundation was um, involved. Um, it, it's exciting that Flare decided to integrate Stellar Lumens as an F asset, which is cool. Uh, Flare is an independent network. It's interesting because like Stellar, like, you know, we talked about the Stellar consensus protocol. That's technically something called a federated Byzantine agreement system. So is Flare. So there's like a lot of similarities between the way the networks work. But also like Stellar, you know, f the, the people who are building Flare, um, they just went ahead and did that, right? They didn't. They didn't ask our permission. They didn't have our help. Um, they they can do that because of the way that their network is set up, and because and this gets back to the internetwork interoperability idea, because these kinds of networks can exist in parallel and can bolster one another. So it's it's pretty cool that that they're doing that. Um, you know, I, I, the, the the Flare network has not yet launched, so I haven't played around with it or anything. But I, I do find it to be. I do find that potential to be quite exciting. But again, just to be clear, that's an announcement that Flare made um, of an action that they took. Uh, it's not It's not something that we, that is sort of coming from inside the SDF. Right. Um, somebody also asked, so given the explosive growth of DeFi, is Stellar doing anything to incorporate these protocols? Or what is St Stellar's involvement with DeFi? Yeah, it's a really great question. I mean, first of all, I want to say that Stellar, part of the reason that it works so well is that it's super optimized for payments, right? So initially, the, all the initial design decisions were focused on the things that we sort of talked about today, on making asset issuance easy, on making it easy to exchange assets, on making all of that happen quickly, low cost, low environmental impact. Um, so Stellar was not designed with you know, Turing complete smart contract capability like Ethereum. And so it's not, you know, it, it is not out of the gate uh, sort of uh, designed for all the DeFi projects that are uh, that are launched on Ethereum. However, um, there are a lot of initiatives that are happening both in the Stellar ecosystem and inside SDF to start to think about ways to connect Stellar to other networks better, to allow um, sort of DeFi protocols to operate on Stellar. And I think we're at the, you know, there's been a lot of interest and there are a lot of prototypes. There's a lot of experiments. There are a lot of ideas. And if you go, you know, if you go look at the, like at, at any of sort of the, the, the Stellar channels, you'll see that there's a lot of different companies out there that are exploring um, th th these, uh, how to bring DeFi to Stellar. And uh, I, I think we're gonna see some pretty cool new innovation, both coming from within the SDF and from the ecosystem as a whole over the course of the next year. So we're getting there. Well, Justin, that's a great segue to kind of the last question we typically like to wrap up with, which is what's next on the horizon for SDF, uh, either for the year or you know five years ahead, however you'd like to look at it and answer. Lauren, you want to take this one? Sure. You know, I think our five-year goal is what we kind of talked about in the presentation, which is setting this global payment standard and putting the pieces in place to ultimately get there. We have a pretty comprehensive roadmap on our website. So if you go to stellar.org slash roadmap, you can kind of see what are all of our big goals for this year. Um, you know, a lot of those are around building up more anchors. 
Uh, a lot of that is around um, investing. We have an enterprise fund where we, you know, try to bring new companies and support existing ones in the ecosystem to kind of help us help them, uh, you know, build up their business and, and meet these goals also. A few other ones around liquidity and, and, and a whole bunch of other really interesting things that we're tackling this year. So again, you can see all of that on the website where because we're open source, we, uh, you know, we take transparency to heart. So we try to be as open um, about what we're working on uh, with our community and our ecosystem as possible. Brilliant. And for everyone that tuned in today, we will both share a recording of this um, of this webinar um, and we'll share the links that uh, both Justin and Lauren mentioned um, so you can have information to learn more. Uh, thank you so much, Lauren and Justin, for joining us. It's been a pleasure. And thank you to everyone who tuned in and for your insightful questions. Uh, we will be back in two weeks with the next GBBC Virtual Members Forum. You can follow us online for updates and uh, we'll also share the links so you, uh, to follow Stellar so you can learn more and keep up with their progress. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sophia.